Here, let's, let's all do it together. One, two, three. Coming, Coming up, up next, next, the, the Buccaneer reads Beowulf. <laughs> My name is Nathan Alberson. I'm your humble and obedient host. I'm joined today by Pastor Jacob Menzel. How's it going, Jake? It's all right. And you're the pastor who's a master of reading. So I am. And I'm also joined by Mr. Brandon Chastine, PhD, ABD. How you doing, Brandon? Doing great. How are you? Oh, pretty good. Good. Ready to talk about some Beowulf. Yes. So let's jump right in. So I did maybe want to as we get into the story itself, uh, talk a, a little bit more theory. H- how do you approach a story like this? This is not a novel. It's a, it's a poem, an epic poem, an elegy, whatever you want to call it. Is it doing the same thing? Is it supposed to have the same effect that A Pride and Prejudice or For Whom the Bells Tolls has? Is, is there a different way that you think about it? Are there different expectations you should have for something like this? Maybe the answer is an easy no. Maybe the answer is an easy yes. I'm not sure. What do you guys want to say? Well, the one thing that I do expect of everything that we read here or the expectation I want to place on it is that I expect to be engaged one way or another. I expect to care. I expect to be drawn in to a story of some kind. I expect to care about the characters. I expect to either by the art of the piece or by the story of the piece or hopefully some combination of both to be uh, moved. So by that token, if, I'm not saying this is the case, but if your only engagement with Haney was Haney's verse being good and the story of Beowulf was in fact a flat, boring, two-dimensional monster fighting story would you have to chalk this up? Would you have to give it an F? I know that's like... I think totally we'll, I think we'll well, I think we'd, I would do with it about what we did with From the Beltles, which is a masterpiece of prose writing with... Whatever the opposite of masterpiece is of... Yeah, of, of story. <clears throat> How do you answer the question, Brandon? Difference between approaching a Beowulf and approaching a For Whom the Bell Tolls or a Pride and Prejudice? Well, you want it to be engaging. That I think I've mentioned the quote before where C.S. Lewis says, the very least you want a work of art to entertain. It's what it does beyond that that matters, Right. So that's that's the first thing you do want it to do. As far as approaching them differently, yeah, they are very different. I would say that you're not getting the well, the psychological realism and the ability to talk about the motivations of the characters and the ins and outs of the stories and their relationships with Beowulf as you do with, for example, uh, Pride and Prejudice, right? We're not going to get the deep conversations about who Beowulf is as a character that we got about just the simplest character in Pride and Prejudice. And it is because of a difference in expectations. So these stories, they have their different expectations for them. Beowulf is not that kind of story. It's an action. Yeah. Beowulf is about this hero who goes into the world that works in a very particular way. He goes and he has his moments of glory, and then he has his moment of decline. And the poet's not saying that this is anything in particularly interesting about Beowulf's mentality. He was a good king, but there were other good kings, right? So it's not like that Hyjalak and Hrothgar were bad kings. It's that their moments came to an end. They died. Another king comes and takes their place. And this is the world that they live in. And we get this picture of this particular hero, but it's more the monsters are of interest and the world that they live in is of interest in a way that it's not at the forefront of these of the novel, which is much more psychological and much more character driven. That's actually <clears throat> we were making fun of off mic the Beowulf movie, none of which of us have seen, <laughs> but the computer animated Robert Zemeckis movie apparently tries to bring a lot of kind of Freudian psychological what were these characters really like what were they really thinking what was really going on and it looks like another catastrophe it looks like it looks downright stupid yeah for example they have beowulf uh have sex with grendel's mother which is dumb sure does add an extra layer of something psycholo- psychology to it yay yeah oh the essay that we've been talking about tolkien's essay which is it really is helpful if mm-hmm. listeners should go out and read it, it's really good. He, he, he argues that everyone who wants Beowulf to be a tragedy or everyone who wants Beowulf to be these side stories that show up, because one of the criticisms of Beowulf is that the side stories are more interesting than what actually made it in as the main material. He, he just says that's dumb. That's not the sort of story 
that's being told. And you have to allow for the story that's being told to be told according to that genre. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't try to fit it into something that it's not. So if you approach Beowulf and you're really upset that it's not for whom the bell tolls, then it's just, you know. I'm always quoting the dumbest sources for of criticism, but Siskel and Ebert used to have an adage, criticize the movie they made, not the movie that you wish they'd made. So the dumbest thing you can do is go into a heroic poem like Beowulf, expecting it to be a psychologically complex story or whatever it is you think, expecting it to be a piece of history. If that's what, you know, if, if you want it to be the wrong thing, then you're bound to be disappointed. I mean, that ought to go mm -hmm. without saying, but it doesn't go without saying because it took Tolkien's essay to make a whole generation of scholars look at this poem the right way. Actually, it's pretty interesting. If you, if you do the research, there's two things that are worth saying about Beowulf that maybe we didn't say in the context. Number one, it wasn't really really a work that came into popular prominence until the 20th century with Tolkien's essay. So it did not influence a lot of the Western canon. Shakespeare would not have read it. None of those guys would have read it. It's, it's not something that's actually really been a part of our heritage until the 20th century. People were kind of aware of it and uh, looked at it as a place to go for scholarly research to look at the history of the time. Tolkien, I think, is largely responsible, actually, with his essay his. in, like, what, the 1930s or something mm -hmm. like that for changing that and saying, here's a poem. And a lot of what Tolkien does at the beginning of that essay, uh, which is a great essay, it's called The Monsters and the Critics. You can find it real easily on Google. As he just says, you know, we've looked at this as a historical document. We've looked at it for this, that, and the third. What did it actually, well, now let's look at it as a poem. And he's really arguing. He feels like he has to argue hard that it is, in fact, a poem. Yeah, the other thing that I recommended that you read was the preface to Paradise Lost, mm -hmm. and because I think it's very helpful with Beowulf is too. He argues that th there are two different ways that he sees people misread it. One, they want it to be Pride and Prejudice, and so they don't get it that it doesn't have this depth of psychological... I mean, I don't think he actually says that. The, the, other, the thing he sees is people read it, they think it's going to be a poem, and so they expect it to have like these lines that they can grab onto, and like a beautiful poetry, like a lyric poem. Mm -hmm. And then it'll have these little lines that are interlaced throughout and he says that's not the way the poem works the poem works by its weight you have to read the whole thing and that's how narrative poetry works is it works by the larger chunks that fit together right i think he's primarily actually talking about milton at that point yeah. but it applies to all narrative epic poetry of this type that if you go in looking for that one little the same thing that you get out of like say a sonnet or or something where it's got this one little line or idea or turn of mm -hmm. phrase or just beautiful little way of looking at things you're, you're doing the wrong thing and you're going to give up you're going to get lost what you have to do is look at the weight of the thing and, and the accumulated weight of it as you read the whole piece. That's that's how these stories work. And actually, that's one answer I'd give to the question of how do you approach this different than you might approach a novel. I think it helps to read a larger chunk or in a longer sitting so that you get some of the accumulated weight so that the language and the world kind of seep into you. Uh, where with Pride and Prejudice, you can just read a, little, a witty little chapter and laugh and then go do the dishes. Uh, it really helps to be kind of swept up into this kind of poetry, wouldn't you guys say? Yeah, I think that was part of the trouble that I had with it, with wanting to read it again this time, was just not having large chunks of time to devote to it. Whereas before, I was able to just read it out loud to myself for an evening or two, and I think that was it. That, yeah. was, that was it. And I, that is why I ended up going with, uh, with the audio version, because so, I could do other things and just listen to Heaney read it to me. And it seems to me with this poem in particular, even though it's episodic, the two sections play off against each other so well. It seems to be that actually reading it in one setting would be the ideal way for even more so than Homer. Or the you know with Homer, it's like you can read the story of the Cyclops as its own thing. I suppose you could do that with Grendel and Grendel's mother and the dragon. But having the contrast of old Beowulf against young Beowulf and youth and dynamic action over age and wisdom, I think it, it would almost work better. And in... well, yeah, it really brings home that. Um... That thing that he says at the end, you know, as he's about to go face the dragon where he says, you know, warriors, uh, li life is short and we all we all die. And all a warrior has are his deeds. All that matters is the glory you get for yourself as a warrior. It brings that, that weight of how he's thinking about that home and, and reflects back on sort of heroically on, you know, why he did what he did with Grendel, why he did what he did with Grendel's mom. It was... You know, I'm a warrior. This is who I am. And all that's going to live on is the story. And so might as well have a, have a go at it. Might as well go at Grendel without any weapons because, you know, yeah. it's, it's going to, you know, and it, it, he wins. He wins and he wins. And then he goes and he fights his last battle and 
he wins while losing. Yeah. Life is short. Get glory while you can. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the themes, it really is set in the first three lines. We have heard of those heroic deeds, the courage and greatness of these kings. And that's what this is about. We hear of his courage, we hear of his greatness, and then we hear of his demise, his death, and he, it's it's over. That's all you need. It's almost yeah. like it's, it's it reminds me a little bit more of a movie than it does of a novel. You know, the Beowulf yeah. novel would tell the whole story of his birth, of how. But no, this is just like the good stuff. It's just, yeah. you know, it's just what you need. It's here's the big scene that defines his character. Here's the scene that reiterates his character. And then, oh, there's what happens to his character. Well, yeah. To bring back that critic I was talking about earlier, Walter Benjamin, he wrote this book called The Story to the essay called The Storyteller and His World. I think is what it was called, where he says that for this this sort of thing, you have to understand the situation. We've already talked about it, where you have the bard and he's speaking to the people, and that's that's the context of this poem. It's not supposed to be read in a sitting room or in your living room, you know, where you can, yeah, or in your bed at night. That's not how it was intended to be listened to. It was intended to be heard. It was intended to be taken in in big sections so the weight of it could fall on you. It uh, has a seriousness to it, the solemnity of the court, which is what C.S. Lewis argues, right? It has this solemnness to it. And so the sorrow that's there, it plays throughout. That's why um, I think that these little side stories are important because every side story that comes in is tragic, right? Even when Beowulf is winning, you have these side stories that come in and rem- remind the reader that death and treachery and just revenge. revenge all these things will come in and they cause the deaths of good kings and so eventually you just have this stupid little thing happen the servant goes to get the cup and then the dragon comes out and that's what kills beowulf it was just a stupid thing that happened right and the monsters that are always on the outside of the world in this sort of nordic vision it has here of the courageous hero standing and fighting against the monsters even though he knows that he will lose in the end that's that's what matters so, and that is the difference between Achilles and Beowulf. Achilles only cared about Achilles' glory, but Beowulf does care about um, those under him. He cares about those who were given to him to protect. While well, he does care about his own glory as well, but um, and he cares about destroying the evil, right? It, the, yeah. Well, the poet is always making clear that sort of his glory is first, but he's always making you know before he goes down to face Grindel's mother, he he makes it, it, this is where I want this to go. And yeah. he's making provision for people. And the la- last thing he says is look at the wealth that I have acquired for my people. Yeah. I think, well, obviously we've segued into actually talking about Beowulf. So I, let's actually talk about him as a, as a dude. I think the most noble thing, the, the part where I really like Beowulf is just that thing of the king dying back in Geatland or whatever it is. And Beowulf not seizing the throne for himself, but supporting the king's son until such mm-hmm. time as the king's son gets killed or whatever it is. That's the most noble side of Beowulf we see. I found myself, I think I've, I, this is me being a 21st century jerk and bringing, bringing psychological realism where it doesn't really apply. But uh, I found myself a little irritated with Beowulf for being such a kind of lunk-headed jock in this reading. You know, he's always like, I'm going to get glory. I'll fight the monster all by myself. And remember that awesome swimming contest where I beat Becca and had a sword in my mouth and Becca sucked and I was awesome. It's just like <laughs> and he didn't bring that up, so be fair. It was that guy who hated him. Right. The, the guy um, who hated the him. Sniveling Unferth yeah. or whatever. Yeah, his name. Unferth comes in and he's like, Hey, I heard a story about how you got your butt kicked in a swimming contest. It's a Beowulf's like, Yeah, actually about that. We got we were neck and neck and I we got separated. I ended up killing like nine sea monsters. <laughs> and I, I I don't know who won, but I killed nine sea monsters, so what have you done? Unfair. What have you? Yeah. yeah. What have you been doing here while Grindel's come and? Yeah, yeah my irritation <laughs> with Beowulf may just be because I'm Unferth and I'm like, ah. Well, and also you see some monsters. of Beowulf's nobility even with Unferth because isn't he the one who gives him his sword and then he gives it back to him? Yeah, at he the does. End? Yeah. Right. He does. And so if that was Achilles, he would have struck him down and killed him. Right. <laughs> but Beowulf is. Big Beowulf enough to makes get him over a friend. It. The comment, and then the, the other. Yeah, I'm sorry. Can I, no, one one other thing is Hrothgar compliments Beowulf on how well spoken he is, mm-hmm. right? And so Beowulf has the ability to speak well. He's educated. He's so. I mean, he's got the strength that makes you jealous. I mean, yeah, you're like, man, I wish I was Beowulf. But he's also intelligent and well spoken, and you know, a young king in training. The weird part that I had with Beowulf was the when he goes back to Hygelic's court. I'd never noticed this until this reading, where apparently he wasn't respected. Yeah. Did you guys? Catch yeah, on to that? I That's did see that. Yeah, was it? Did it have to do with his lineage? I mean, his dad was 
good. Kakafagao or whatever that guy's name. It was almost like he was just a upstart and wasn't very well liked. Nobody really thought he would amount to much. They were all really surprised that he'd come back with this glory and with all this treasure and stuff. Like that provided a little. That provided some strange background that I never had. Yeah, it was a little weird. Yeah, because when he goes off sailing, everybody is like, "Oh man, look at this guy. He's a." fell warrior yeah well, you feel like clint eastwood's like striding into the town and he's gonna clean up you know it, it has yeah and everybody's yeah. like whoa the champion has arrived right beowulf <laughs> a lot of it reminds me of you know david yeah um king david from the bible yeah yeah he takes the giant sword and cuts the giant's head off he mm-hmm. he's doing all of these feats that prove his greatness before he becomes king mm-hmm. in that well, sense yeah. yeah i think there's something to that um a, a lot of Old Testament king relationships to people, are, I think, are throughout this. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. I read somewhere that the Anglo-Saxon world, like the kings, like to imagine themselves almost as Old Testament kings. Yeah, and so that that would definitely come through. The other thing that I was sort of thinking about because I've been reading King Arthur t- to my kids is how much of a knightly, chivalrous sort of. I don't know what to say. How knightly and chivalrous Beowulf is, or how knightly? Yeah, yeah. yeah the, you see, you see, you see. So, if I don't know as much of the history of Beowulf as you guys, but you know, if people are saying, um, okay, well, this is the transition from pagan to Christian, and you can see how the chivalry and the knighthood of Arthur's time rises out of a context of Beowulf. Mm-hmm. If Beowulf seeing, is the warrior. We're seeing the more primitive you, version of it. Yeah, when you Christianize the warrior, you get Arthur's knights. That's true, yeah. Because, you know, he's still out for adventure. He's still out for glory. He is some. He's benevolent. He may be me first, but he's benevolent. And then you take that kind of warrior mentality. And, yeah, when you take that kind of man and you make him a Christian man, you're going to get something much more like the medieval knights. And so it sort of made sense for for me uh, of where that came from as Christianity spread to these people. Yeah, and as easy as it is for me to judge Beowulf in my unferthian envy, if you think about it that way, I think it's helpful because what you're looking at is you're looking at a very primitive, almost tribal culture where people have to unite around these kings in order to survive. I mean, it's one step up from, I don't know what the right analogy is, gangster fights or cavemen or what, but this, the strongest, biggest guy survives. He builds a hall. He, he gets warriors to come to him. He has a woman whose place is to just make the men feel happy by serving the mead, I guess. I don't know what the ladies do in this yeah. culture, but besides that... She has a little speech there. Yeah, she does have her little speech. Well, it's it's like Jake was saying. It's the beginnings of the courtly tradition. Mm-hmm. So Christianity would bring the chivalric, sacrificial elements of the knighthood and give sort of the quasi spiritual stance of the king Mm -hmm. but you see the early courtliness here with when you go into the court there are manners and there are you know there's dignity to the position of king and you're expected to act a certain way there's the feast table there's the poetry there's all these early things that arise out of these feudal systems so you can see the uh celtic and Anglo-Saxon origins of the Arthurian story. I love the Arthurian story, and I mean, I mean, it has it has definite roots in this period of history. And the obligation that you and the love you feel towards the king, and that's why the real tragedy of this is at the end when his men refuse to stand with him. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, to the people listening to that, that should have that's disgusting. Mm-hmm. Like these men would not stand with him, right? And so they bring their own doom upon themselves because they wouldn't stand with him. Their enemies are now going to come and invade because they know they're cowards. Right. Especially for a guy who's famous for traveling across an ocean to help out a little kingdom that he has some relationship with, but he doesn't have to go health out growth car. The only reason to do it is to help him out and get a little glory in the process. But for him then to not even have, you know, his warriors stand by him is sad. Yeah, and it's not like the reality of death isn't there for him. He knows with each fight he could die. It's not Mm-hmm. He's not so uh, prideful as to think that he is going to win. He thinks that with the help of God, he'll win, is what he continually says, right? And what the poet says. So, But you'll see that carry over into the Arthurian stuff, too, because they'll go out off onto these weird adventures that you don't quite understand why they're doing it. Just And the whole point is for glory and for helping, right? You go off and you fight. Well, why are you doing it? Well, because that's what a knight does. 
Right. He risks his life for the possibility of saving those who are in distress and for personal glory. Anything else stick out to you guys about Beowulf as a character? I think the simplicity of the story and the simplicity of him as a character is just being sort of a manful doodly dude is refreshing. Yeah. He says what he's going to do, then he goes and he does it, and he's manful about it, and he takes his life in his own hands, and he has some idea that he's trying to help other people in the process, and that's just really, uh, that's refreshing. Yeah. There's no... Not complicated. Yep. He's not duplicitous. Yep. It's just, it's what he's a warrior. This is what warriors do. So it's what he does. Yeah. He's a king. It's what kings do. So it's what he does. Yeah. And I suppose he's no more of a braggart than Muhammad Ali or... <laughs> Uh, yeah, he's a Kobe Bryant. <laughs> he didn't really strike me as a braggart. <laughs> uh, well, there, there's the interesting part where Hrothgar warns him about becoming prideful. Remember that? That is interesting, yeah. yeah. And he says that he's seen kings, when they become successful and they have all these good things happen to them, they grow prideful and then they refuse to help. And then eventually he says, what's the point? You die. And that was something interesting I hadn't picked up on before, but I forget where I saw it. But all the gold that they get from the treasure, it's all rusted. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so that's the, the way the poet's saying, look, it, all these good things, they're going to die. Not just Beowulf. The gold itself is going to rust and it's going to fade away. There's got to be more to this. And what the poet adds is that, you know, there is more to it. There's looking to God for help and for guidance that these pagans didn't have. Right. In their world, this is the best they could do. So there's that part where he's stand, sitting on the cliffside and he's sad. Because he knows he's going to die, right? But he knows he still has to go and do it. Was Beowulf, did you guys think of him as, the the? there is a weird tension, as everybody and their mother has commented on, between the paganism and the Christianism in the story. Is Beowulf a Christian? I mean, they make allusion to the creation story. They don't. They don't ever actually make an allusion to Christ. Is this supposed to be set? Is, is, the, is our poet setting this in pagan times, or is he setting this in early Christian times? Everybody makes allusion to God. The poet certainly makes allusion to God having hand in things. But is it the poet giving a Christian reading of a pagan story? Or is it the story of a Christian king? I don't know. The first time I read it, I thought, this is just an old school Christian or newly Christianized man, people. And this is what it looks like for them to be trying to be Christian men. It's not like everybody's got a Bible, and it's not like... It's definitely not what Wilson thinks. No, I mean, Wilson thinks it's... Wilson and maybe Tolkien, too, say that it's... What we're looking at is the fictional pinnacle of pagan civilization. We're looking at a fictionalized, hey, this is the best that the pagans had to offer, and look, it still ends in death. Yeah, and I I just don't know enough to know anything about it. I just accepted the first time I read it. It seemed a natural thing to think, well, these these guys are newly Christianized. And yeah, I mean, it, Grendel goes to hell. Yeah. Beowulf, it kind of sounds like goes to heaven. It doesn't actually say he joins his fathers in the meat hall of... Yeah, well, what, whether this is just the poet or not, you know, they speak, they have some understanding of providence, the mercy of God, right. the justice of God. They certainly... It's, and that pervades the their men, the mentality they bring to the battles, to the fights that they have. And the whole thing starts with Grendel being irritated by some bard singing creation stories. Right. Um, yeah. If those things were only said by the poet, then it would be a lot easier. But, I mean, Hrothgar says, Dear Beowulf, choose you know the better part, eternal rewards... He says, I praise God in his heavenly glory that I live to behold this head dripping blood. Right? So there. <laughs> I hope I get to say that sentence someday. <laughs> it's just, there's enough they say directly about God and about, like you said, uh, their understanding of justice. And it's almost like the poet is Christianizing them, even if they were supposed to be set in a time where that wasn't even possible. But why is that a problem? Yeah. And the the poet does give Beowulf in his death. His soul fled from his breast to its destined place among the steadfast ones. I was trying to remember. I knew it was something like that. So yeah. the poet, if he's presenting pagans, allows one of his pagans to basically go to heaven. I mean, I know I'm being too literal about it, but... Um. Well, that was an interesting question because... Tolkien's whole beef with the early critics was that they tried to make it too historical, right? right? So There's no question that we have a Christian poet looking back on a pagan tradition and telling stories yeah. that probably arose out of but pagan tradition, but that doesn't matter. Yeah, according to what you're saying is that it doesn't matter 
if he's also looking back and then Christianizing them right. too. Which right? is what it seems like yeah. he's probably So he's doing. making Beowulf a Christian hero in a time where maybe that wasn't possible, but it doesn't seem like he really cares about history too much. Right. He's telling a good story to his listeners. And what kind of hero do they want to hear about? Well, they want to hear about a good Christian hero who goes out and, like Jake said, fights with manliness, these mm-hmm. monsters. You know, if I'm in England and I'm descended from these people or whatever, I want to believe the best about them. This is my grandfather. These are my great. This is my great. I want to believe I come from good stock. I want to believe that these guys. I, I want to believe that I'm in embracing Christianity. I'm. I'm not betraying my fathers, my history, and my past. I want to believe that these guys. You know, they had something. Whether any of that's true or not. In the same way, we want to believe that Washington and Jefferson and Adams. You know, the same way that you see those guys get Christianized in ways that may or may not be true from case to case. I think it's interesting that Beowulf doesn't have an heir. I don't know if there, there's any real meaning to that, but I did think that was interesting. It's interesting that he kind of pops up and then disappear. Like he's kind of this Melchizedek or something. It's yeah, just exactly. like he's there, he's there and then he's gone and. All this history that we have allusion to in other places is happening around him, but he's just this weird, hey, I'm Beowulf. Okay, goodbye. The passing of the good king, and no good king is there to take his place. And all you can do is wonder what's going to happen now. Right. <laughs> Which is where the, the, that's where the poem leaves you. I mean, Beowulf dies, and there's no man to take his place. Well, you know the rest of the story. It's yeah. We're here in England. But the poet does go out of his way to give you tons of... And then the messenger came and said, this this X, Y, and Z is probably going to happen, and it's going to be terrible. And, I, and then Which the poet, we're all supposed to know is exactly what happened. Right. And the poet even says, like, and mostly he was right or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Anybody else want to say anything about Beowulf? Well, I guess the only other thing I've read is that um, some people think that there is the tragedy and that he's warned by Hrothgar not to be prideful. And then he goes and he refuses to have help when he fights the dragon at the end. So they see that as his tragic flaw. But he never lets anybody help yeah. him in these great battles. That's just like that's just like part of the code or something. I don't know. That, that's part of the lunk-headed jockey, jockishness that bugs me a little bit about him. But I think I'm wrong and Beowulf's right. Like... Yeah, it doesn't bother me. I don't think it's a tragic flaw on his part. I think he's the warrior. He takes it on his shoulders to go and fight the dragon. Well, if you look at the last battle, it's almost like it was Beowulf's place as the protector of the kingdom to say, I'm going to fight this dragon alone. And then it was his dude's place to run to his aid yeah, and to say, say, I'm not hey, going to let that happen. I'm not going to let that happen. So Beowulf played his part. The only problem was that <laughs> only one Nobody. of his soldiers played theirs. Yeah. Right. And Wiglaf's obviously a great guy and obviously did what he needed to do. And comes back and shames everybody for it as well he ought to have done. Right. I mean, what even when he fought Grindel... You know, his men jumped to the fight. Right. We know. We all know Beowulf could have just swam over to Herat by himself and fought a couple sea monsters and not brought anybody with him. But he's got his posse for a reason. Yeah. Well, and and they joined the battle with Grindel. It's just that, you know, there was some enchantment where their blades couldn't do anything to him. Mm-hmm. So even though they tried, he had to do it himself. All right, you guys, we're going to play a fun game, a contest between Brandon Chastine and Jacob Menzel. Uh-oh. <laughs> okay. It's not baseball, is it? <laughs> no. He's no going, he's, not, can it be basketball? <laughs> he could no stop one knows. Me. I mean, if people can't see me, I'm a short, fat guy. Jake's very tall and athletic, and so <laughs> that's why this is funny. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we are playing, though, we are having a, an athletic contest of the mind. Uh-oh. <clears throat> In a game that I've invented. That the tables gonna, have been turned. We're going to have a Kenning contest. Guys? Let's I, do this. N- well, we're not going to make Kennings. I'm uh. going to give you Kennings, and you're going to tell me what they are. Oh, okay. So, okay. in other words, if I say Sky Jewel, you say... Sun. Right. Oh, well. oh, he's going to beat me. <laughs> Jake has one point. We'll start. <laughs> we'll start. Yeah, give him it. No, no. I've got like 10 of these, and whoever gets the most points win. You actually have to ring in by saying your name. How about that? You say, (laughs) Jake, Jake! (laughs) (laughs) Or you say, your name is two syllables, sucker! (laughs) Brandon! (laughs) Scott. Uh, Scott, yeah, you can say Scott if you want. Scott. Kyle. We'll we'll do our most... uh... (laughs) You You ring in by saying your name, then I will call on you, then you will... So don't just yell out, sword! But I will call on you, then you'll say what it is, and you'll be right or wrong. You lose a point if you're wrong, you get a point if you're right. Huh. Okay, so Kenning number one, guys, Jewel, Jake, Jake. Son. correct. Kenning number two, Battle Sweat, Jake, Blood. Wow, 
That's two points for Jake. No points for Brandon. <laughs> no points for Brandon. Can it number three? Girl of the Houses. Girl of the Houses? Girl of the Houses. You're the overthinking girl, it. Girl of the Houses. Jake. Scott. Oh. Queen. Jake loses a point. He's back down to one. Well, that would have been my guess, so I'm not going to guess. I was my guess the whole time, and I thought, I'm not going to risk losing a point. Yeah. And girl you said that you're overthinking it, so I said, I'll just go with my gut. And you said Jake before I said Scott. Girl of the Houses. You guys both lose a point if you can't guess it. Uh, you better Scott. Get... <laughs> yes, Brandon? Girl of the Houses. <laughs> Wife. Correct. How is that not the same as Queen? Oh, well. Queen and a wife. Yeah. <laughs> How many houses do most normal married <laughs> my men wife have? Is my queen. Yeah, your, your wife must be a very happy woman. I was going to say, how is queen not the same as wife, guys? <laughs> hey, darling. <laughs> um, oh, I like this one. Feed the eagles. Jake, kill someone or something. I'll give it to you. It's kill your enemies. Okay. Pretty cool, right? Yeah. Uh, Are these all taken from Heaney? Uh, no, they're taken from Wikipedia's King, examples. Uh, okay. <laughs> Page on Kennings. <laughs> um, okay. Grimnir's lip streams. <laughs> wait, wait. <laughs> what? Grimnir. It's another word for Odin. Odin's lip streams. <laughs> Odin's lip streams. Yep. <laughs> Scott. Rain. <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> Brennan is back down to zero. We're currently at two to zero. That was an awful guess. <laughs> that was a good guess. You got to guess. I have to guess or I lose one automatically. Well, you both lose a point, so it's to your favor, I guess, if you don't guess. But Because he if loses you another one. If you want to be a manful warrior like Beowulf, you'll guess. Jake. <laughs> I call on you. Odin's oh. speech. No. <laughs> Jake loses a point. <laughs> Can I lose another point? No. No. If uh, I wouldn't have guessed, you would have lost another point. Jake's down to... Two? No, <laughs> right now, right zero to one? It's, we're zero to one. Grimner's lip streams. Does anybody want to take a final guess? Lightning? No. <laughs> Jake loses a point. Shut up. <laughs> I didn't call it. River. <laughs> okay. For five points, whoever guesses it. Odin's lip stream. Stream. River. Nope. Much more metaphorical than that. Much oh, more nice. poetry. Boom. Brandon is winning with five points. <laughs> what? <laughs> five to one. I think I give him a... S- <laughs> How many have I got these? <laughs> I hate you. <laughs> See if they can bring it back with... I will bring it back. Okay. Uh... <laughs> Whale's way. Jake... The river or the no, ocean, I, the sea. Shut up. The sea. It's the sea. You lost a point and then you got one back. So you you're, can, you, for a net gain of zero. Uh, I can't remember I what to call myself. myself. I was ever good. <laughs> <laughs> Bloodworm. Jake. Dragon. Jake's down to zero. What? Uh, that was my guess. Blood. Um, Jake, Scott. Brandon's down to Scott. Four. Okay. Scott. Okay. Yeah. Bloodworm. <laughs> Guts. <laughs> Brandon's down to four. <laughs> Bloodworm. A gross version of blood sausage. <laughs> <laughs> Documented. <laughs> um, uh, it's, I'll, I'll give you a hint. It's a worm that draws forth blood. A oh, leech. Wh- leech, yeah. No. Call your name for a real guess. Oh, Jake. You said it w- he, uh-huh. he said it wasn't a leech? Or he said no. I did say it's not a leech, so don't guess that. But you're, you're Snake. Serpent. Nope. Jake's down to negative one. Wow. And it's not a dragon. It's not a creature of any type. I'll, I'll tell you guys that. It's a total metaphor and a weird one at that. A whip. <laughs> <laughs> no, that would be awesome, though. <laughs> why, why am I not losing points? Because <laughs> you didn't actually... He wants oh, Scott. Uh, yes. You're going to lose a point for this because you're ringed in. Yeah, I know. Unless you guess correctly. You have to say something now that you rang in. Yeah, I know. That's a metaphor. Is it, is it a weapon? <laughs> you can't tell me. A sword. Correct. Brandon is up to five. So we're five to negative one. <laughs> <laughs> I 
However, this one is worth two points. Okay, here we and go. And only negative one, so this is a good chance for you, Jake, to, to get up to one. <laughs> um, icicle of blood. Icicle of blood. <laughs> You've done so many random ones that I... Jake. Yes. Sword. Yes. Right. <laughs> it's the obvious one, but it's just like... I don't know. Blood worm is also a sword. I'm not trying to trick you, but I don't know. <laughs> Shouldn't he be up to one? No, he was at negative one, so he's up to zero. I thought you said that was worth two points. Oh, you're right. <laughs> he's just bent on. No, I'm not. I'm not against you, man. I want it to be fair. If I'm going to have victory, it's going to be. <laughs> Wound ho. <laughs> H-O-E. <laughs> a wound. <sighs> Scott. An axe. Uh, incorrect. Brandon is no. not four. <laughs> I'm going to let it tick down so that you... So we both go four. down one. <laughs> Wound ho. <laughs> you guys know you want to. Jake. Spear. Nope. Jake's down to zero. Jake. Sword. Yes. Are they all, Jake's up to one. Are they all sword? <laughs> yes. That was, our last, that was our last sword. They had a lot of kennings for swords back then. Bloodworm, icicle of blood, and wound ho. <laughs> Just my wound ho. <laughs> okay, uh, we've got two more to go. So, all right. But it's anyone's game because Brandon could screw it up and lose a bunch of points. Yeah. Feeder of ravens. Jake, warrior. Absolutely correct. Very nice. Tree breaker. Scott. Tree breaker. Mm-hmm. Axe. Incorrect. Brandon's down to three. You could tie it here at the end, buddy. You're going to lose if you let it run out. If you both lose a point, you lose. You got to go for it. Tree breaker? I have another guess. Go ahead. You go ahead. Go ahead. Do you have a guess? Did no. you say Jake yet? No. Whoever rings in, I'll give it. <clears throat> Tree breaker. Do it. Scott. I don't know if, which one I want to go with. Wind? Correct. <clears throat> yeah. That was one of my two. I was either going to go with wind or storm. And yeah. I figured he wouldn't give it to me if I said wind and it was storm. <laughs> How about bone house? <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was a heaney one. Bone house? Would that be a cemetery? or a... No. Oh, that's your, just your... The body. Your, your body, yeah. yeah. Burned his bone house. All right, so Brandon wins the Kenning contest with four to Jake's two. <laughs> it was a good game. Yeah, it was a good game. You could have tied it up at the end. It was a fun game. You just, you just, you should have said wind, and you should have trusted yourself with sword that one time. Icicle of blood. Icicle of blood. They got that one. They got that one. And so, plus, I did get five points just thrown at me. <laughs> those five points could have gone to anyone. I did not feel like I weighted things in Brandon's favor. I am an impartial Kenning contest. <laughs> I'm happy to win. <laughs> what do I? What do I get? I'll buy you something from the vending machine later. <laughs> All right, Brandon, congratulations. You just won the Kenning Contest. Yeah. <laughs> you are a feeder of ravens. Thank you. <laughs> when it comes to Kenning, you're a warrior. You bathed in Jake's battle sweat. I got that one, too. <laughs> <laughs> Today was written and produced by Nathan Alverson. It was performed by Nathan Alverson, Brandon Chastain, and Jake Metzel. If you want more amazing content like this, you can go to warhornmedia.com. We've got all the back episodes of our amazing podcast and also great articles by people. You can hit me up on Twitter at, at NotFamousNathan. You can hit Jake Metzel at, up at, at Jacob Metzel on Twitter. You can send us a Twitter, send us a tweet, get in our feed. 